I've been reading uh, the latest book by Brian McLaren, and this book is a book on spirituality. And McLaren talks in the book about how he uh, fairly regularly encounters people, I, I suppose when they meet him and hear what he does, they, they say something along the lines, well, well, I'm not really religious, but, he says somehow there always seems to be a but that goes with the word religious. He says, but I'm spiritual. It seems that an awful lot of people in our society feel a, a distinct tension between religion and spirituality. I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And, and McLaren was, said he was curious about exactly what this meant. And so he said he has taken to, over the years, asking people, when they say that they're spiritual but not religious, to ask them, I'm curious, what do you mean by spiritual? And he says that over time, four distinct answers have repeated again and again and again, enough that he saw a pretty clear pattern. He said, so when people say that they're spiritual, he said, first of all, what they tend to mean is that the answers that they get from the secular worlds of politics, of work, of technology, of economics, aren't all the answers. There's, they, they say that they, they don't find all the answers they need for life there. There is a hunger that the world's ideologies and culture and isms just isn't needing, and they're looking for something more. Secondly, says McLaren, these same people, when they say they're spiritual but not religious, they say they don't see organized religion as having all the answers either. In fact, they're troubled by organized religion because they see it as too complicit in a lot of the problems that they see in the world as opposed to helping those problems. Third, says McLaren, that when people say they're spiritual, they're speaking of a sensitivity to the sacred dimension of life, to the sacred dimension of all of life, to bodies, to work, to relationships, to nature, to history, and on and on. And they're, they're looking for some sort of expression that does not remove the sacred off to some little corner of life that doesn't separate the sacred out to God, eternity, heaven, worship, so on. Finally, he said, these people who say that they are spiritual are looking for ways, practical ways, to connect to the sacred and to integrate that into their day-to-day -day living. Now, when I was reading this, it struck me that these people would have been right at home with Jesus. And I think Jesus would have been right at home with them. I mean, after all, Jesus had trouble with the answers that were the answers in the day that he lived. Jesus had his own problems with the organized religion of his day. And certainly, Jesus saw the sacred in the day today. Jesus' ministry is lived out in the day today. He lives out his ministry when he eats and drinks with sinners and outcasts. He touches those who are untouchable. He lives out his ministry in breaking bread, in touching and healing and being with and for the poor and the broken of His world. And Jesus says that He is present to us in our encounters with others, especially in our encounters with those who are in need. Jesus understands service to others to be a profoundly spiritual act. It is religious in the very best sense of that word. And in today's gospel reading, as we just heard, 
Jesus enshrines foot washing as an example of how we are to live as the children of God. Now, there's a problem with this enshrining in that foot washing is not something most of us ever encounter. I've never seen anybody's feet washed other than washing my kids in the bathtub. I've never seen feet washed except at a church ritual. It's not part of our day-to-day -day experience. And so it can be very difficult, I think, for us to sometimes appropriate the example that Jesus gives us. Yet, Jesus insists we are to do like He has done. And that if we know these things, we are blessed if we do them. Now we read this foot washing passage the other day in the staff meeting as part of our devotion. And I really didn't anticipate this would happen in our discussion. But, but in the discussion, something of a divide developed um, between those who had found the experience of ritual foot washings, foot washings at church, as a profoundly moving experience and those who had been completely turned off by the experience of a foot washing in the church. And I'm not entirely certain what accounted for the, the very different experience some of us had had with foot washing. Some of it may simply be the difficulty of appropriating as a ritual something that has no connection to daily life. Some of it may be the context of the foot washing itself. For example, it may be that in a spiritual retreat or a youth group meeting where people have been off together and been building these relationships that a foot washing may be a profound moment of the relationship reaching a new level of intimacy and it may be very moving. On the other hand, sometimes when a pastor, a priest, a pope who normally goes about in finery and drives a nice car for just one brief moment suddenly takes this pose that's out of character and does this ritual at a church service. It may feel inauthentic and in fact grating. But regardless, Jesus says, I've given you an example. As I have done to you, you are to do to one another. If you know these things, blessed are you when you do them. The other day I read a story about a congregation, a Methodist congregation in North Carolina that discovered something about the blessedness that comes from serving others. And maybe it will be helpful for us in understanding a way to embody foot washing. This, this church in, in the community where it was had become concerned with homelessness as a problem in their community. And they had spearheaded an effort among some of the other churches to try and do something about it. And so, in the end, they and 14 other churches had gotten together and said they were going to provide housing for homeless people for the winter, for the 15-week period in the coldest part of the winter. And the way it was going to work was each church was going to take a week covering 15 weeks, and they would provide everything that these homeless people needed, and they were thinking you know, 15 to 20 people at a time, and they would provide meals and, and housing and laundry and everything that they needed for that week. Um, and the planning had gone along well with this, everything was pretty much set, everybody understood how it was going to work, and early in November of the year it was about to start, they held a final planning meeting which was primarily to set the schedule. Who was going to do what weeks? And the pastor of this Methodist church had intended to go to the meeting, but pastors get busy sometimes. And so the pastor decided that instead of going, she would send one of the church volunteers to represent their congregation at the meeting. And the person she asked to go was a, a relatively new member, uh, a relatively new Christian who was very enthusiastic about her faith and about the mission of the church, and you should see the problem coming up right here. Um, so this, 
This person went to be the church representative at the meeting, and the meetings, uh, before she went, the pastor gave her a list and said, now here are some convenient dates in January and February, and make sure and sign us up for one of these weeks. I don't care which one, but one of these weeks. So they go, and the meeting gets started, and the past, mostly pastors there, and this representative from the Methodist Church. And pretty soon, though, a problem emerges, an impasse of sorts. No one, none of the churches will take the week of Christmas. Understandable. Having this event at the church during the week of Christmas is going to interfere with Christmas week activities. It's going to interfere with Christmas Eve services. And it's going to be difficult to get volunteers for the week of Christmas. So nobody will take the week. Now this this enthusiastic volunteer is watching all of this and getting a little more stirred up and a little stirred up as people he and Hall about uh, not being able to. And finally, she, without really thinking, jumps up and is upset, slams her hand on the table and says, I can't believe this. Jesus' family was, was for all practical purposes, homeless in Bethlehem at the first Christmas. And not one of us, not one of these churches, of you churches are willing to take homeless people in to your church on Christmas week, shame on you. And it did shame everybody. All the pastors kind of you know, put their heads down. <laughs> felt bad, but not bad enough to take Christmas <laughs> week. <laughs> At which point, this woman says, we'll take, First United Methodist Church, we'll take Christmas week. We'll not only take it this year, we'll do it every year. And as soon as she said that, so move, sack out at the meeting. <laughs> and as the meeting ended, and she goes back, tell the pastor about this great news. <laughs> great, great news, pastor. We get to host people the week of Christmas, and we get to do it from now on, every year. Now, understand, the pastor didn't think this was such great news. She was wondering, how are we going to get people to volunteer on this week? What are we going to do about the services? People, people are going to want to spend time with their families. They're going to be going on. What are we going to do? But she, she was wishing she had gone to the meeting now. And, you know, but what was done was done. And so all they could do was start to plan. And so the next Sunday at worship, they announced, here was the situation. They were going to be hosting these people the week of Christmas, and they really needed volunteers, and the pastor was extremely worried how this was going to go. But the volunteers came out of the woodwork. Parents with children, young children, said, we want our children to learn that Christmas is more than presents. People who had lost loved ones uh, in the year before jumped at the chance to have something to do during the season that would fill the void that they knew they were going to experience in their lives. And when the, when the week rolled around, they had way too many volunteers. They had lots more volunteers than they had slots to put them. And so when the 18 homeless people came in, the food poured in that week. These people ate like kings all week. People brought clothing and coats for the winter ahead. People brought presents for Christmas, especially presents for the children that were there. And they didn't just volunteer and bring things. They spent time. They gave lots of time. They got to know the people. They came and sat with them at night. They, uh, they played games. They did activities with them. They got to know them. Somebody set up a three-day-long Monopoly marathon tournament. <laughs> And they really did get to know the people as people. Lots of people spent the night. Lots of church members spent the night. And when Christmas Eve rolled around with the Christmas Eve services, that was none of the homeless people were required or as part of their staying there to attend. But every single one of them came to the service. And they were welcomed warmly into the worship service that night and according to the story as I read it they said that everyone 
encountered a holy moment during that Christmas Eve service. And they did it again the next year, and the next year, and the next year. And every year was the same. The pastor said it was always the highlight of the entire year at this congregation. And they'd done it for six years. But the story has a rather odd ending. After they had done it the sixth time, the pastor got a phone call from the pastor at the Baptist church. And, and the Baptist pastor said, you know, everybody in town knows about all the fun that y'all have doing this every year at Christmas. And I was just wondering if you'd be willing to share that. We would really like to do the week of Christmas next year. Jesus washed their feet. He says, if you know these things, Blessed are you when you do. All praise and glory to the God who comes to us as a servant and calls us to do likewise. Thanks be to God.